Temple and Deborah, welcome to the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's so good to see you both. Thanks for having me. Yes, and, and Richard here. So uh, I'm also just uh, uh, I, I, I mean, a great fans of the books you guys have been writing, let alone, of course, Temple, Your Extraordinary Life. Deborah, we know a little less of you. They haven't quite made a movie of you yet. But keep working on it. I'm, I'm sure they will. It's a, it's a wonderful privilege and, uh, and uh, it's so pleasing to have you on and to talk to you. And we're talking to you about uh, the, the prompt is the new book, uh, Navigating Autism. Now, Matt, what, what's, uh, what's the, the, the process today, do you think? Well, um, let's do um, some very brief introductions. Um, I mean, I'm sure everyone is very familiar with Temple Grandin, but um, possibly not so familiar with Deborah. And so maybe, um, Deborah, we could learn a little bit more about your background. And then I thought what might be good, um, apart from some specific questions that you've got, Richard, is that we go through um, some of these mindsets that you have laid out in your book, because we are talking primarily to therapists. And uh, these are just fantastic uh tools, mindsets uh, for therapists to know in their practice. So how about we go along that track? So what will we do? We start with start with you, Deborah, if you if you'd be so kind. Sure. Um, I was a licensed psychologist in California for about 35 years. I retired about five years ago and now I'm I'm uh, writing and had the honor of doing that with Dr. Grandin. And I became interested in autism probably 15 or so years ago and read everything I could get my hands on and found it a fascinating field in which psychology was way behind and most therapists were not trained. I certainly wasn't, but that was because I, I'm old, but even the young therapists were not getting good training. And I wanted to change that. So that became kind of a specialty area of mine. And I really enjoyed the neurology of it and the psychology of it. Okay. And Temple, uh, how did you bring your, uh, you and Deborah come together? Because uh, you've done a few books now. Well, the first, we did the book, The Loving Push, together. Because one of the big concerns I have, I'm seeing a lot of smart kids on the autism spectrum where they're not learning basic skills. They're just um, playing video games, things like that, getting glued to tablets. And, and we, one of the things we did in that Loving Push book is review the literature on the addictive nature of video games. And what I'm seeing is that a kid on the spectrum that gets addicted to video games, they're not going anywhere. They're not becoming video game designers or anything constructive. <laughs> and and I'm... Uh, We've just got to get these kids out doing a lot more things. I mean, one of the mindsets is introducing a kid to the real world, like yeah. learning working skills, learning how to shop, just basic stuff. The other big problem we have with autism is when the kids get older, you're going all the way from Elon Musk, who recently disclosed that he has autism. This is Ashley Vance's book about Elon Musk. And six years ago when it came out, I stuck some post-it notes into the pages where, where, I, where I described where I thought he was autistic. You know, now he's publicly disclosed. So at one end, you've got Einstein, who had no speech at age three, would be in an autism class today, uh, to somebody who doesn't learn to address themselves, and it's, and it's still called autism. That doesn't really make very much sense from the standpoint of, um, you know, what the person can do. When the kids are little, like when I was three, I look really severe. You see, you do early therapy, and then they kind of go into three groups of so fully verbal, um, no intellectual impairment. Uh, then you have a mid-range group, and then you have some that are non-verbal. Uh, but the thing about some of the non-verbals is they actually have some uh, kind of a locked-in syndrome where they've learned to type independently. They have scrambled sensations, and they can't control the movements. You've got books like Tita Bunkapata, hey, how can I talk if my dumb, uh, lips don't move? And The Reason I Jump by Noki, the Japanese boy. And there's a sequel to that book that's even better because um, Noki is older, has more insight. It's, it's interesting because there was a, a, it was a, a very, very interesting aspect to what was a, a fairly uh, sort of 
action-packed film called The Accountant. Um, but the uh, one of the main characters was exactly this very highly autistic, as you say, in this, uh, as you say, they're nonverbal, uh, movement impaired, uh, yet was able to manage a computer. So uh, that actually became a, a really fascinating aspect of, of of the story. And they looked at this, the, the other character who was at the other end of the scale, who was very verbal and managed, but unfortunately he got involved with criminals and uh, and hence it went off into some sort of those, but those sorts of things. you look at people like Thomas Edison, yeah. uh, Nikola Tesla, the inventor of the power plant. Yeah. Michelangelo was probably autistic. Now, what enabled these individuals to do something good, like great art or invent all kinds of things? One of the things is early exposure to um, the profession. Michelangelo was exposed to great art in all the churches, and he was exposed to the stone cutting tools that he'd need to make his sculptures with. Um, uh, Thomas Edison uh, had a mentor who taught him how to be a telegraph operator. He was selling newspapers really young. And getting exposed to getting out there and making things. And Elon Musk was an entrepreneur at a very young age. He didn't get addicted to video games. Uh, he wanted to sell them and make them. Now, the thing that's interesting in Elon Musk, and I looked up uh, the video games that he would have played based on his age, they were the old Mario, Mario Plummer things that just weren't very addictive. Another thing that was different about those video games is they broke all the time. And you get what's called blue screen of death, but the blue screen of death's all full of code. And then the kids would get ah. interested in that code. I call that computers showing their guts. They don't. Ah, have but, it, but exposure again. I mean, that's a really interesting thing that, that there was this cultural aspect of saying, oh, well, these kids have got some problem. Let's take them away from uh, from exposure. And of course, exposure enriched environments. I mean, that's just a standard. Uh, but I want to expose them to stuff that can turn into worthwhile good careers, yeah. not a bunch of, of bad stuff. Um, yeah. I was brought up in the 50s where we lived by Roy Rogers' rules for living. And this is some really good rules. Roy Rogers was a famous cowboy. Yeah. And he had some really good rules for living. You can look them up. And uh, that's how I was brought up. Wonderful. You know, the yes. importance of being a, you know, a good person. Now, Deborah, this must have been a fascinating um first meeting and first engagement uh, for you, having sort of studied the thing, but having this this dual experience of someone who is um, who is themselves uh, classified as autistic, but also extremely knowledgeable and and, and capable and and theoretical as well. What was what was that like? It's it's um, still bewildering to me how I ended up co-authoring with Temple. Um, I, I think one of the things that I have appreciated about Temple and I've appreciated about so many of my autistic clients is I know exactly where I stand. Uh, mm -hmm. I know what Temple thinks, she tells me bluntly. Um, there are no games being played. Um, we're concentrating on facts. Uh, she suffers no fools and obviously is brilliant and that's rare that and that is one of many those are are, are several of, of many qualities of autistic folks that are so underappreciated and I think one of the things that motivates Temple and I both is that there's nothing more exciting than a person reaching their potential and there's nothing more tragic than a person not reaching their potential and the autism world, and I would say the psychotherapy world and perhaps the mental health world in general, just tends to be very heavily medical modeled and very heavily deficit based and focused. Yes. So yes. like diagnoses of, of any condition, that's just par for the course. And in autism, I think that causes us to underestimate children and adults. It causes us to narrow our scope of what we expose them to. And even for instance, we focus on the social skills deficits. And yes, 
they need attention, but there are plenty of adults and Temple, you might want to speak a little bit more to this, who their social skills remain pretty poor, but they do just fine career wise. And I would rather see them instead of spending, if we only have 10 hours, I don't want to see the majority of that in a social skills group. I want to see that exposure to the real world. That's how I want their time to be spent. Yeah, well, I, I, I would not, I would agree with that. And also getting exposed to things that could lead to a career. I get asked all the time how I got interested in the cattle industry because I came from a non cattle background. I was exposed to it as a teenager. Yeah. And, mm. and I think one of the worst things the schools have done is taking out all the hands-on classes because they expose you to careers like music, theater, art, sewing, woodworking, cooking, welding, uh, building things. And, and we actually have a shortage of high-end skilled to trades right now for designing equipment, uh, building factories, uh, just doing all kinds of things. And, and the big problem I'm seeing, too many parents getting so much into the medical model that you might have a 16-year-old teenager, really smart, who has never gone shopping or gone on the bus. This is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've um, been hearing about is um, uh, autistic people going out on their own because they're, not, they're unable to fit into you know, a corporate structure or, or to being employed by somebody else, but they have, a, they have talents, they have skills, and they seem to do better launching out on their own. Uh, what's... What's your take I, I would, on that? I would agree with that uh, mm. because I worked with two people. I've got to be a bit vague about what they build and make mm. but because they're not officially diagnosed, but um, they own metal fabrication companies. Mm. One of them's dyslexic, autistic, stutterer, terrible student, took a welding class. Now he makes a specialized equipment and he sells it all around the world. So that, wow. you know, is making his own business. Yeah. I mean, Elon Musk is, you know, his own business. You know, that yeah. would definitely be true. Yeah. So when it comes to um, to any sort of therapy, intervention, parenting, you know, is this something to keep in mind to be uh, encouraging or at least to see as a as a option? Absolutely. I would like to see IEPs focus less on academics mm -hmm. and more on transitioning to young adulthood and vocational preparation. We know the biggest predictor of success vocationally is having had a job during high school, a real paying job, not a volunteer job. Now, if you can't find one, then a volunteer is great. But if you get a real paying job and not in your family business, but someone who's a stranger who you have to learn to show up on time, you have to learn some skills, you have to learn to accept feedback, those very real world things that will then transfer. Research shows that's the biggest predictor. And I think a psychologist or any other kind of clinician can incorporate that into their approach and focus less on, again, some of the deficits and do some exposure therapy. Um, think outside the box literally get outside the office and take the child to some environments where they can practice some of the skills that you talk about. But, you know, the thing is that as psychologists, most of us are verbal thinkers. Yeah. And that does not work. So when we work with an autistic client, if we just um, try to amplify our verbal communication, it's like talking louder to someone who's hard of hearing. It doesn't Oh, hit yes. the stop. Yeah. And instead, we have to know what kind of thinker they are. And Tibble can talk more about this in a second, but we have to know that it's probably not going to be verbal. It's probably going to be visual or visual spatial. And we have to use tools that reflect that in the therapy. And I don't think therapists are being trained to do that. Well, they, uh, I'm an extreme visual thinker, and that's what's called an object visualizer. In fact, I discuss that in detail in my book, The Autistic Brain. That book presents the science. In fact, that's the book right there. That prevents, presents the science that different kinds of thinking exist. Everything I think about is a photographic, realistic picture. So that's going to make me good with animals because they're, they're sensory-based thinkers. Good at art, graphics, um, mechanical things because I can see how it works. But the thing I'm bad at is algebra. 
and I never had passed an algebra class. So I managed to get out of it just due to a quirk in the what was required in 1967. And I'm seeing that holding a lot of kids back, you know, the person that could be that brilliant mechanic who can fix anything. Then you have your visual spatial. This is your more mathematical mind. This is the kid that'll be into music, computer programming, mathematics. Those things tend to, to go together. And the object visualizer and the visual spatial are two different kinds of thinking. And the research is very, very clear on that. Yes, and that yes. research is covered in the autistic brain. And even though that book is a few years old, the um, the new research just supports it even more. There's a lot of new research that just supports it. And then you have your verbal thinker. Now, it was a shock to me to learn in my 30s, late 30s, that other people were verbal. Because if you say to me, think about something like a church steeple, I start seeing specific ones and I'll name off the churches where they're at. But when I asked the speech therapist one time, think about a church steeple, she just got pointy things. You can see here, a reused paper. You can see a photograph of some flooring on the other side of this. I was just shocked that just got um, two lines for a pointy thing. Yeah. That was a wake up call. Like, wow. Where, and and that's we're why sliding. She became a speech therapist. Yeah. I think we're sliding rather beautifully and uh, uh, segwayingly, as I make up the word, into this this subtitle of the of the of the Navigating Autism book, the Nine Mindsets for Helping Kids, uh, and we're kind of I think we're set up for that now. Is it possible for you guys to just work through just bantering between yourselves about the the principal ones or the ones that you would like, or all nine, if you you know if you're so willing? Sure. Oh. And, you know, I think the thing that's in common for all the mindsets is that we want to look at the whole child. We have someone who has this label, but that's not their primary essence. And they're an individual. They have different temperaments. They have different traits. They have different environments, different families, different resources. And we have to bring that to every stage. We have to bring it to the evaluation. We have to bring it to the treatment planning. We have to bring it to the working with the team and preparing for the real world. So that's the underlying mindset that goes through all of the individual chapters. Well, I always want to mention... One of the things that you've said, Deborah, is label locking. I'm seeing people get so locked into the labels, and I think it's a bigger problem for the verbal thinkers getting locked into the labels. Because, see, for me, I'm seeing individual cases, like this person that um, sells equipment all over the world, and what saved him was one welding class. Uh, and then I'm seeing somebody that's uh, very severe, and then I'm, I'm, I, I've met. Tito, who's nonverbal, who types independently, I'm seeing him. He's very different from the person that runs a metal fabrication company. Yeah. You see, it, it's it's specific. And I've been learning more and more about you know, how the verbal mind works. Verbal mind tends to overgeneralize. The visual thinker like me tends to get hung up on too many details. But I form concepts by putting specific examples into categories. And I'd put the two metal fabrication owners uh, in, the, in the category along with Elon Musk and Einstein, Michelangelo, and put those people in that category. And then you've got some where they can hold a job at a grocery store. That might be a mid-range. And then you have, um, you have the nonverbal may have difficulty dressing. But the thing about them is some of them have a, a true locked-in syndrome. And they have a normal brain hidden inside a dysfunctional body. Uh, Noki discussed um, in some of his writings that he was like a broken robot and he could not control his movements. Wow. Yes, yeah, so it's such a, uh, I'm just thinking of Bobble and the, uh, his his work, this locked in syndrome. We've seen that in the uh, the severe mental uh, uh, and brain disorders, but this is a fascinating thing with people with these uh, aspects like autism and, and various others that, that within what might appear to be uh, uh, problematic bodies and, and, and things. And it reminds me of a time I spoke to a lass with spina bifida. Uh, I was at a particular uh, psychotherapy yeah. conference and, and I said to her, I said, what's your, what's your biggest bugbear about this? And her first one, her top one was people think I'm stupid. Uh, and she just had, you know, just sort of had a wonky walk 
but uh, let alone these these movement disorders and so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, this is when I what motivated me to do some of my early projects, like the dip fats that were shown in the HBO movie. Um, I want to prove I wasn't stupid. Yeah, yeah, that was a yeah. huge motivator for me. Yeah. How interesting yeah. to 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 actually have that pressure again. This thing of of um, that we talk about um, uh, having to prove who you are based on uh, a generalized negative bias uh, towards yeah. Yeah. something about you, whether it's your movements, or, I guess skin color, and, uh, and all those other different issues. But let's 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 shuffle back to these nine mindsets. Yeah, uh, so what may, have we may, got there, um, Matt? Yeah, Deborah, in terms of just looking at the first couple of mindsets, um, it, just talking about uh, intake, uh, talking about those uh, in, initial sort of getting to know the client, what, what are we to be looking out for? What, what are we to be doing here specifically for autism? I think you want to make sure that you're looking for strengths intentionally, um, not just the fallback of looking at the deficits. I think in an evaluation, you want to make sure that you're giving equal time to strengths I think that you want to give the child an opportunity to show you those. And that means being a little uh, more creative than just giving the same testing administration to every child that comes through the door. Um, you need information ahead of time in order to customize an evaluation. You need information from the parents. You need information. Um, sometimes home videos are full of good things that then you can follow up on and get more information. You need to know a little bit about the associated, associated conditions, both psychiatric and medical, because you don't want to miss those or you don't want to misattribute something to autism that's not really autism. Um, you want to know more than just the DSM. You, you want to Expose yourself to, you know, it's like the old um, idea of the blind man, the blind man looking at the elephant. Or yes, the six, bl the six blind men and the elephant. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And whatever you happen to, you know, focus on, that's that's what you think an elephant looks like. Well, that's very true for the professionals working with an autistic child, if you ask a speech therapist or you ask a psychiatrist or you ask a psychologist or you ask a special education teacher, you ask a physical therapist, you get different focuses. We know that. But we kind of forget that as a therapist. We forget that we're really limited. So we actually have a little chart and questionnaire. We have a lot of charts, a lot of questionnaires in the book. And, and one of them, for instance, is what are the pitfalls for each profession that they might over be likely to over focus on. So you want to get out of your own silo, communicate really well with the other professionals. And also one of the other things I would say is you want the parents of a child to kind of be your co-therapist and your co-evaluator. You really want to use their input. And when you do an evaluation on a child and you write a report, I would like folks to write reports that are easy to understand without a psychology background and are actionable, that have resources and suggestions and again, are strength-based as well. Yeah, yeah. Now you, you, did, you mentioned um, associated medical conditions. Can we tease that out a little bit? Because that's very important because it can muddy the waters a lot, I know. Temple, do you want to talk about that? Or would you like yeah, me to? Yes, I can talk about that. Uh, one thing that the research has shown uh, very clearly is that gastrointestinal issues are often associated with autism. Yeah. A lot of um, uh, of uh, times. I was just at an autism conference live just uh, very recently. And there was a little boy that was pulling out his hair and doing real severe self-abuse. And I said, the first thing you've got to rule out is a hidden painful medical problem. Maybe he has an ear infection, a sinus infection, a toothache, okay, since he's attacking his head, and, and acid reflux problems and um, pain from uh, acid reflux is common. I talked to one family because my mind thinks in specific examples where um, in one of my other books I had recommended using acid reflux medicine and I had a family come to me and say, you just saved this simple yeah. for the counter drug 
uh, and raise the head up of, of the bed a little bit to keep the acid in the stomach, uh, all these behavior problems stopped. So you always have to rule out um, a, a, a medical issue that has nothing to do with autism that causes pain and discomfort, you know, constipation, diarrhea. Yeah, these things, you'll be pleased to know one of the documentaries we're doing is on the gut and the gut brain axis and the, the importance of, of what happens down there, not only with our own gut, but of course, with all the, the, the expansive um, flora and uh, other, the, the microbiota, as they call it. So this is, this is so true that the, the brain is not just sitting there doing one thing. It's, it's responding to everything. Uh, so that's a terribly, terribly important thing to bring up. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. So, so what well, are the things the other that we thing, got? Um, you know, skin rashes. I've got um, skin rashes, eczema. That's uh, that often just happens. Uh, allergies sometimes that happen, and these things, you know, this uh, cause discomfort. And one of the mistakes I see doctors make all the time is they get so locked into the autism label, label locking. That's one of Deborah's favorite words. Yeah. And I agree with that, that they say, well, the kid just has autism. And they don't uh, think to treat some of the medical problem that's causing some of the behavior problems. Right. Is that so because the behavior problems can be quite broad. And so it's just too easy just to put it all under the one umbrella. Of well, then, they, then they look into the, some of the, into, you know, his ears and find out his ear infection or an infected tooth or, um, there was one kid who'd shoved the bean up his nose. This is an example a long time ago. <laughs> and one. it rotted up his nose. Yeah. And when they pulled that out, um, his behavior got a whole lot better. I think <laughs> mine would too, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now we we've going going in there and this these um so there's there's the mindset. I mean we talk about mindsets for helping the kids, but some of these mindsets are in the mindsets of the therapists and of the of the parents and of the teachers and of the employers. Is that uh, that that gets a big nod of the head from Deborah? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I I think as a therapist you work as much with the parents and for when you're working with older children, you work with the school and you work with potential employers as well, as much as the, the adolescent. Uh, if you've got a child who is, say, anxious, and they happen to have an anxious parent as well, that child's not likely to get exposed to much or get um, you know stretched very much because the parent's anxiety is going to get in the way and the child is certainly being anxious already, going to not protest and, and want to just stay in the same situation. Um, so a lot of times I would have to work even individually with usually the moms, sometimes the dads, but usually the moms to get them to let go because they we're so used to advocating for their child because that's so important, especially when the child is young, that they didn't shift as the child shifted. Oh. Well, and they're not learning things like ordering food in restaurants, shopping. I mean, I was doing a little shopping stuff when I was seven and eight years old and, and I had an allowance and um, there were certain items that mother considered allowance items like comic books, candy, and little toy airplanes. And I got 50 cents a week in the 50s. That bought a lot, lot more stuff than it does now. <laughs> and if I wanted a 69 cent airplane, I had to save for two weeks. And looking back on that, I'm realizing the important things that that taught me that were just so important. The other thing, I just got a nice email from an autism consultant, and I suggested that she um, take some of her teenagers that were on the spectrum out to a restaurant and do our 1950s teachable moments. Uh, and like if I stuck my uh, finger in the mashed potatoes, mother didn't scream no. She'd say use the fork. In other words, take them out of the restaurant and then quietly correct the social mistakes. And I got a nice email back just today that said that it was um, really working. Yeah, and just that simple bit of information. You don't have a fake restaurant. You go to a real restaurant. Take one that's fairly quiet, and. Um, have them order the food, and uh, these are the kind of things we need to be doing. Yeah. And you calmly tell them when they make a behavior mistake what they should do. 
on my very first uh, job, I criticized some welding and I said it looked like a pigeon had doo-dooed on it. <laughs> and the plant engineer pulled me into his office and explained calmly. I had to apologize for the rude talk. I didn't have to say the welding was wrong, but apologize for the rude talk. He told me quietly what I should do. And I went up to the cafeteria because Whitey the welder was in the cafeteria and I apologized. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. And, uh, and and by learning, absolutely. Yeah, uh, Matt. I was just going to say, I would imagine for um, for, for parents, um, going out and doing sort of real world things like that would be uh, risky because you, you know, you don't want to, you know, expose maybe your child to a situation that, you know, they might uh, embarrass themselves or, or, and, and so this is uh, this is risk taking, but it's, it's worth the risk, right? Well, when you pick a restaurant out that's quiet, don't pick a noisy one, go there when it's not so busy. I mean, I'm um, okay. Child not wanting to go to a big store like Walmart yeah, um, or some other similar store in Australia. Well, when you first start doing that, um, I take them there when it's quiet. Uh, the other thing was some of the sound sensitivity that can often be helped by letting the kid control it. It's like a car horn. Let them beep the car horn. Turn the hairdryer on and off. Some kids hate automatic doors. Well, go there when the store's not busy and let the kid make the doors open and close. Yeah. Where yeah. they control the sensory thing that they don't like. That sometimes helps to desensitize it. Yeah. And and some of these really interesting things that uh, that the the children do. I'm thinking of of one particular lad and uh, the mother would take him to the department store and uh, quite a few years ago now but there would be an escalator that would take them down to the food hall and she said by the time they got down to the bottom of the escalator this poor child was in a fetal position on the ground asleep you know which is but that was the self-comforting thing and you had a bit of a uh, an unusual way of, of finding comfort for yourself well, back I in like the, I in was well, I'm one of the people that responded really well to deep pressure. Now, it doesn't work for everybody, but and um, I used to like to get on sofa cushions, have my sister sit on them because I uh. like to deep pressure. Um, I liked heavy um, blankets. I would make the bed really tight because I like that pressure. And then when I went to my aunt's ranch, I saw cattle being handled in a squeeze chute, hold them still for the vaccinations. So I went and tried out the cattle squeeze chute, and then I made a squeeze chute device for myself where I could control it. You see, this gets back to the control thing. Mm. I couldn't stand to be hugged, and then I've made a padded version of the squeeze chute, but it had an air-operated control where I could control it. See, helping to desensitize um, sensory issues, this element of control is extremely important, where the dreaded sound is turned on and off by the child. There was another case where um, they were terrified of the buzzer on the scoreboard down in the gymnasium. So they took him down there when nobody was there and let him push the button repeatedly. Then he started tapping out tunes on it. <laughs> now that's an easy thing to do. Yeah. And, and Bandura was telling us about this years ago with self-efficacy. I mean, it's it's just a slightly different uh, uh, a different orientation of the way it's expressed in, in perhaps in the autistic child. Mm -hmm. How did you find this management, uh, Deborah, with uh, as you're working with autistic kids? Self-efficacy is right at the top of the list of what is important. You have to have a sense of mastery and you have to have a sense of control, like Temple said, and choice. So you don't want to take your agenda and shove it on a child. You don't want to give a child surprises. You want to find, for every child, and there's one of the mindsets is to working within the growth zone. You want to take that child and just take them one small step beyond that, but not so much that they're over overwhelmed and have too much anxiety, but they have to have a little anxiety. And you were talking earlier about the parents and that, yes, it feels like a risk to take your child out, for instance, to a restaurant because they might have a meltdown. Those are risks that have to be taken. There's really Absolutely. no way. Absolutely. I want to no talk way. about driving. Yeah. yeah so, so it's really asking for a bit of courage from the, the, no, the parents. A lot of courage. A lot of courage. And, and a lot of... Um, you're working even when you're exhausted. 
uh, because it is it can be exhausting. So but I don't want to out, pick out my places life. that are low risk. Uh, like um, if I hadn't learned to drive, I would not have done been able to done the career that I did. And I started out on dirt roads in my aunt's ranch. I started out had to learn how to do a manual transmission in the middle of the horse pasture. So you start out in the open field where there's nothing to hit or an open parking lot yeah. where there's absolutely nothing to hit. You know, you keep it safe. And one of the problems you got with autism is uh, multitasking. So to deal with the multitasking issue, you've got to practice, practice, practice probably three or four times more to get the operation of that car totally into your motor memory before mm. you go near traffic. Yeah. A yeah. whole lot more practice in very safe places. Yeah. And that's true for most things for autistic children um, or teens. You're going to need to do repetition more than maybe for another child. Uh, but once it is in memory or muscle memory, if it's a physical activity, it usually sticks really well. And because autistic children are very logical, if they can have the logic of a situation explained to them, they are very easy to work with and they actually don't get sidestepped or side derailed by the emotions sometimes that a neurotypical child does. Yeah. So, but again, the therapist, the same way that therapists are often verbal thinkers, uh, if you think of a continuum of emotional, social, to more logical thinkers, the therapists often are on the more emotional end. So if you're gonna work with autistic children and teens, you've got to make that adjustment. Right. That's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. Now, can, I've just got a, um, a question that I'd like to ask based on experience with a family, um, with a young lad who, uh, he's on the spectrum. He's terribly interested in a very specific subject, birds. Um, he can he categorizes them. He knows everything about them. He, um, and uh, do, do, do the parents sort of go with the flow with that and encourage that and feed that very specific, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that um, is um, all consuming for him. What you got to do with something like the birds is you need to expand it. You right. brought it so it's less fixated. That's a really good thing. There's a lot of good careers that involve birds. Mm. But there's a tendency for it to get very narrow and uh, fixated. Mm. And and so you want to learn more about all oh, their migration patterns, uh, read about them. Uh, there's different, different careers you could do in birds. The other thing I want to emphasize is the difference between an interest, such as birds or cars, and an innate ability or a strength. Mm -hmm. A strength would be the visual thinking, the mathematical thinking, the word yep. thinking. Birds or cars are an interest. Mm -hmm. And I'd be really happy he's interested in birds rather than playing video games all day. Lots yes. of good careers there. And I uh, need to be reading about famous scientists that studied birds. Yeah. I uh, start reading some of the research literature. You can go on Google Scholar and yeah. look up all kinds of free scientific articles on birds and so, really start to um, yeah. expand this into something that become a career. So to so capital, you, capitalize on the theme. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Deborah. That's okay. You want to take that specific interest. And like Temple said, you want to expand it. And one of the ways you want to expand it is by knowing the child's style of thinking and uh, build, yes. build on that strength. So one child who is fixated on birds, and I don't like the word fixated, erase that. We're going to say who is passionate about birds. Fascinated. Yes. 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 Um, that child may be a... Uh, visual thinker, let's take them into learning about all the different kinds of feathers and how those feathers are constructed and the colors of those feathers and mm. the beak. And they may start to draw those um, animals or they may start to think about 
containers for birds. They may come up with some innovative designs for cages. They may be able to help design enclosures at zoos. For another child who's not so much a visual thinker, they may be more mathematical and they could do research, mathematically based research on populations of birds, on issues of extinction. So take that strength, that kind of thinking, and then take that interest and expand it. And not just expanding it in terms of the information, but the experience, the real world experience. So get that first child out and have them meet up with somebody who draws birds professionally. Let them watch for a day. Get the second child out and let them go on um, a hike with someone who's doing research on birds. Mm. Let them experience it. Uh, we Again, back to that idea that we so often underestimate kids and what they can do. If they've got an interest, they're probably going to be able to sustain that interest longer than a neurotypical. Right, and then you might yeah. have a word thinker who's interested in birds. And uh, he'd be very good at uh, keeping track of like bird census counts and things like this. Another question I get asked all the time is how do I tell what kind of thinker a person is? The optic visualizers like me uh, be, tend to be good at drawing. And one of the ways I sold the jobs is to simply show off my drawings. Good at building things and mechanical things. Uh, good at art, um, the graphic design. And that often will show up at around age seven or eight. That's when you start to see it, not at age three. The mathematical-minded kids um, pick up music. But again, if they're not exposed to a musical instrument, uh, they're not going to learn how to play it. Um, expose them to computer programming. I tried computer programming. I wasn't able to do it. But another kid tried the same course and just take off in it. And a mistake that gets made um, with some kids that are really good at math is make them do the little baby math over and over again, and then, then they're a baby problem. And then yeah. the word thinkers... They, they often love history. They love facts. And they'll know all the statistics about their favorite sports teams and, and name uh, all the different movies and who was in them and when they were, when they were uh, you know, made and stuff like that. Uh, it usually shows up and it's pretty obvious. And so-called normal people are much more mixtures of different kinds of minds. But you end up getting a label. You tend to be more extreme. And the object visualizer and the more mathematical visual spatial thinker are actually opposite traits. You're not going to find a super good object visualizer and a super good mathematical mind in the per same person when you get into the extremes. Okay. Yes, it's this. I'm just sort of also wondering the the I'm imagining some that you could moving into the conceptual frameworks. I mean, like with birds, perhaps they might get interested in aerodynamics or that's in, right. Uh, that, that uh, be the mathematical, the uh, engineering uh, side of it. Yeah, but and but and you translated some of those observations of cows. Uh, and the movements of them at abattoirs and things, and and you deduce this this concept of um, of the, the well the damage that was caused by upsetting them by by making them unhappy and and so on and so forth. And so there's some great conceptual uh, ideas that roam around in the background of these of these thinking. Well, one of the ways that I sold equipment was I showed how they could reduce uh, have better meat quality and reduce damage from bruising. Because yeah. bruises on the livestock have to be cut out and it's thrown away. You can't uh, you, you can't sell bruised meat. It's cut out. It might go for fertilizer or animal feed. Huh. Yep, we 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 saved the money, and <laughs> I think the cows are very grateful. Well, but I found that that's how I could sell jobs. Yeah. And now people are getting much more concerned about the ethical um, implications. But I've been in this industry for fifty years. Back in the 70s and 80s, I had to show how it would save money to sell jobs. The thing I found, selling equipment was a whole lot easier than getting people to operate it correctly. People want the thing more than the management. I was just talking to somebody recently, uh, basic stuff for veterinarians or for uh, humans. Okay, you wrap a bandage too tight. Well, somebody wrapped a bandage too tight on a cat's paw. 
and nobody noticed that a cat almost lost its leg. Wow. Uh, that's basics. That happened right now. And we still have to, that's management, basic hmm. management. And the, they should have seen it when the end of the paw started to get swollen. Uh, unfortunately, they got it off and the cat recovered. But I've been finding all the time just the most basic things in management. You have to keep um, talking about it. And I'm this, well, I've been around for a long time and this kind of stuff hasn't changed. Yeah, we're, we're, we're a fabulous species and we're a terrible species at the same time. Uh, we've still got a long way. I, I hope that reincarnation is true, so I'm still here in 100, 200,000 years will we actually improve a bit. But I want to <laughs> see these kids get out and do everything that they can do. Yeah. And yeah. The, one of the things I've been observing is grandparents coming up to me and they discover they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed. Well, that uh-huh. grandparent was taught manners the same way I was taught. Had a paper route at age 11. I know paper routes are gone, but this is where you do do a volunteer job at a church or a community center or a farmer's market where they're doing a task on a schedule outside the home and somebody else is the boss. This is really important stuff to learn. Beautiful. Now, look, look we've, we've traversed along you know, through so much fantastic territory. I'm, I'm sure we've missed something. We are sort of getting to the time where we kind of have to wrap up. Well, one uh, of the things we one of the thing, uh, things in the book that we didn't talk about is other conditions associated with autism, such as ADHD. Oh, brilliant. Could we talk ADHD about that? ADHD and autism have a lot of crossover, both genetically, behaviorally, and on the brain scans. People get way too hung up on um, on the um, on the labels, yeah. and a lot of the treatments for ADHD and autism are similar. OCD can uh, co-occur in autism. I hate the term comorbid. I think that's yes. an awful medical word. I do not like to use that word. And then anxiety is another big issue. And I had terrible problems with anxiety, and I discuss it in my book. Uh, thinking in pictures and I'm, I take antidepressant medication at really low dose and it stopped the anxiety. It also cleared up some of the colitis I had because oh. I was no longer in a constant state of anxiety. And uh, that uh, I've had some genome scans done on me and uh, autism is a whole lot of little tiny code changes that are involved with what makes the brain big. It's embedded in the genome for giving humans a large brain. Now, genetics popped up on why my teeth are horrible, why my skin is horrible, why I had anxiety. That was much more simpler genetics. But um, uh, my fear system was like on overdrive all the time for no reason. And that can be very debilitating. And this is where um, you know medication, like a low dose of an antidepressant can be helpful. But just yesterday, I was at an autism conference. I talked to a mom of a five-year-old, and they were putting her kid on heavy-duty antipsychotic drugs, uh, such as resveratrol, and she got her kid off of them. And I said, you did absolutely the right thing. I am appalled at the amount of medications that are handed out to young children like candy. And I talked to a family where they might be on six different things. And when I asked them why they did that, I find out no thought went into it. They were just throwing drugs at problems. This, this is trying to normalize, which is uh, a huge mistake we have in our, our research, is to find find what's, uh, I sometimes sort of disparagingly say, that we find out what 75% of the population do and then tell the other 25% they're crazy and either drug them or therapize them to death. But the, 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 um, the normalness of a person is in the person. Uh, and in their capacities, you're saying right the way through uh, this whole talk, Temple, this ability for them to function in a way that satisfies and is pleasing and is engaging for themselves. Well, the other thing I want to bring up is the importance of mentors. I had great teachers, starting with my mother when I was very young, my speech teacher, my primary school teacher, Anne out at the ranch. I was reluctant to go to the ranch and mother gave me a choice. I could go for a week or I could go all summer. Mr. Carlock, my science teacher, who got me motivated to study because now studying was a pathway to a goal. And then there was a very good contractor, a former Marine Corps captain named Jim Uhl. And he was um, starting a little construction business and he had seen my drawings. And so he seeked me out. 
Now, I've had people say to me, why does Temple just talk about our own experiences? Well, I also talk about other people's experiences, but a visual thinker is a bottom-up thinker. I think in specific examples. Now, the little boy I told you about in the meeting, that's not me. Um, but I, it's the opposite of verbal thinking, where you get a, 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 a concept like autism, for example, where I'm seeing like different types of autism, but I see the specific examples and put them in like different categories on a spreadsheet. That is how I think. Mm. And Deborah, you've been doing a lot of nodding, and I notice your mouth moving a little bit. So there's some, <laughs> probably some things you want to you want to add in there. I'd love to hear them. You, you know, it's it's more the general idea of how much we still have to learn and how much we miss and how much we make these assumptions about anyone who's different and doesn't fit the statistical norm. And it's just so frustrating. That's why my, my body can't stay still <laughs> listening to this. You know, if you think about how society has advanced, I would venture to say it's most the great majority of the time, it's been on the backs of someone who is on the spectrum. Because those are folks who have brains that are wired in a way that they can let go of a lot of the other normal things that take up our time. They don't care about that so much. Yeah. And they can persevere or get quote unquote uh, fixated on special quote unquote interests. Um, and stay with that and focus. And often the ADHD is going along with it and helping that, not hurting it, but helping that. And they also have this out of the box thinking. So they don't just take a baby step in their thinking. They take a leap of faith because they don't care. And suddenly you have someone like Elon Musk taking, you know, four civilians into space. Yeah. Um, well, that's some, absolutely right. I want to bring up another thing. Uh, my social life revolves around friends through shared interests. I was bullied in high school. And the only place I had friends was horseback riding friends, electronic lab friends, and model rocket club friends. And, and I recommend, you know, get the kids involved in things. One teacher started a Star Wars club. And that helped her autistic kid who was a Star Wars fan to get friends. Yeah. But the other thing I want to finish up with is a brain can be more cognitive or thinking, or a brain can be more social emotional. Social emotional stuff eats up a ton of processor space. So you give up some social emotional circuits, and then you get circuits to do geek stuff. I totally geeked out on the latest um, SpaceX launch on. Um, uh, when I went to the Science Museum, an aircraft company a company was there, and they had these super expensive hydraulic systems for airplanes they had on a table there. I had to geek out looking at that stuff. <laughs> wow. um, but it's this is where kids need to be exposed to enough things, like musical instruments, for example. I was exposed to theater. I didn't care about acting, but I made costumes and scenery in primary school, high school, and college. Yeah. But that was a place where I had shared interests and I got bullied in college and making sets and costumes and singing a silly song in a school variety show opened up a lot of friends for me, friends who shared interests. Oh, that's beautiful. And I think that that sense of sharing and being there, that, that might be a lovely note to end on, Matt. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. Uh, we really appreciate um, your time, the, the both of you, Deborah and Temple, and uh, we'll just encourage everyone to, to check out this new book, Navigating Autism, Nine Mindsets for Helping Kids on the Spectrum, and we'll leave a link in the show notes. But thank and, you. And we'll, we'll indicate to them that there's all these this whole uh, uh, library full of books that they can go to because, you know, we Absolutely. can't cover everything in this, mm. in this little, uh, little chat, but there's some marvelous stuff in that temple and thank you for bringing up all those books along the way we, we've got to check those all out. i mean i've read a few of them already so brilliant well the, what the navigating autism does is give you like a broader framework of the whole thing 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where I talk a lot of more specific things. I'm really into the different kinds of minds. I'm really, the anxiety thing I discussed in thinking and pictures. Um, just um, yeah. no, we've got to we've got to like help these kids be successful. And yeah. good teachers. I worked with a lot of people in skilled trades. We were out building big meat factories, and this was the kid the shop teacher turned around. We've yeah. got to make sure that all of these specialized classes remain in the schools. That's beautiful. And Deborah, is there the sort of a final word or two that you would like to, to add? Focus on strengths. Don't ever underestimate and stay fascinated. Yeah, but, and that's true for everyone. Uh, Temple Grandin and Deborah Moore, thank you so much for uh, giving us your time. And on your Sunday, for goodness sake, we, 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 we can't express our gratitude enough. Well, I was just at a wonderful um, autism talk at a science museum for children in Mississippi. I got in last night at midnight. Um, I'm glad I booked a two and a half hour connection because I had a mechanical issue on one of the, on my first flight. Well, we're glad they got you back here for us. So that's great. Yeah, they did. (laughs) All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Great to talk to everybody. Okay. Goodbye.